Welcome everybody to another episode of Coffee with ADHD Experts. This innovative series brings together some of the most eminent experts in ADHD and mental health in the world. We know that the demands on mental health services are rising. We know that this increase can never be met by professionals alone. So the question is how do we think differently about mental health and do, what do we have to change? You are welcome to join us to enjoy this collective experience on ADHD across the lifespan. We will be sharing three short questions that can enhance our proposal as advocates and let other mental health professionals have the chance to listen to their experience. Let me introduce you to Norma, Dr. Norma Echevarria. She's an adult psychiatrist, a president of ADHD chapter in Argentina in the American Association of Psychiatry in Argentina. She's an American Psychiatry uh, uh, International Fellow, and she's also World ADHD Federation and American Hispanic Psychiatry Association member. And myself, I'm Eleonora Justi, I'm PhD, I'm clinical psychologist, and vice president of the ADHD chapter in the AAP in Argentina. I'm also a professor at Palermo University in Buenos Aires and a, a member of the association, a neurological association in Argentina too. So, Norma, you'd like to introduce to our yes. guests? Yes, of course, it's my pleasure. So, Dr. Thomas Brown, he's a clinical psychologist who received his PhD from Yale University and specializes in assessment and treatment of high IQ children, adolescents, and adults with ADHD and ADD and related problems. His more than 30 years of experience, Dr. Brown has contributed over 30 journal publications, award-winning books, and presented numerous speaking engagements and lectures throughout the US and in more than 40 other countries. Dr. Brown has also been elected a fellow of the American Psychological Association. For his research and teaching about ADHD, Dr. Brown received an award of honor by the National Attention Deficit Disorder Association, ADA, and a distinguished professional award for the HELP Group in LA. He has been inducted into the Chad Hall of Fame for outstanding contributions to research and professional education about ADHD in children and adults. He has also been elected a fellow of the American Psychological Association. He has published more than 30 scientific articles in professional journals and is author of the Brown Attention Deficit Disorder Scale for Children, Adolescents and Adults, published by the Psychological Corporation Pearson. He is editor of ADHD Comorbidities Handbook for ADHD Complications in Children and Others, a major text and reference book published by American Psychiatry Publishing. Dr. Brown, award-winning attention deficit disorder and focused mind in children and adults, was published in the Yale University Press in 2005. His book, A New Understanding of ADHD in Children and Adults, Executive Function Impairments, was released in Road Leach in 2013. He's a smart but stuck. Emotions in Teens and Adults with ADHD was published by Josie Bayes Willie in March 2014. His most recent book, Outside the Box, Rethinking ADD and ADHD in Children and Adults, a practical guide was published in 2017 by American Psychiatry Publishing. Wow. You know what? It's a pleasure to just have you here. Amazing pleasure for all of us. So well, it's, it's my pleasure. Welcome, I appreciate the welcome invitation. You. Welcome, Dr. Thomas Brown, a friend. I would it's love it. It's my pleasure. The question number one is as a researcher, a doctor, and a writer also, and being one of the main references in this field, what had led you to work with the ADHD population? And in your opinion, how did your interventions make a difference, Tom? Uh, first, I, I would say that uh, I work with these people because I enjoy them. <laughs> I'm very fortunate that I, I love my work. And I learned early on that uh, 
that people that, who have ADHD are often, particularly uh, those who are uh, really quite bright, uh, have many interests and frustrations in being able to utilize those strengths. Uh, and uh, I enjoy talking with them. I trained originally in psychoanalysis and was taught that uh, it's very important to listen to people uh, and try and understand the various layers of, of what they're able to share about themselves. And as I spoke with the kids and with the adults I was seeing, uh, many of whom were uh, very bright, I learned that often people who are quite smart, who have ADHD, do not get recognized as having the ADHD. That people think of this as a failure of willpower. You're just not trying hard enough. Uh, that they, uh, and they themselves are critical of themselves because of their difficulties often associated with ADHD. Uh, but they are told by so many people, you are so smart. You certainly ought to be able to take care of these things. What are you complaining about? And, uh, you know, as I spent many, many hours listening to these people and conversing with them about their experience, uh, I have found that it's very helpful for them to understand the nature of ADHD, uh, making the shift from the, uh, you know, it, this has been around in the English uh, medical literature since 1902. But from 1902 until 1980, it was all about little boys who couldn't sit still, wouldn't shut up when they're driving everybody nuts. It wasn't until 1980 that they put the term attention deficit into the name of the disorder. Mm -hmm. And there has been progress since then. We now know that it's not just little boys, it's also little girls. Mm -hmm. in older boys and girls, in teenagers, and in 70% of cases that also persists into adulthood. Uh, and we know it has nothing to do with how smart somebody is, that there's some people I see who are uh, super, super, super smart, others high average, middle average, low average, slow. My practice includes university professors and doctors and lawyers and big shots in business, a lot of people who are regular folks, some people have trouble doing the basics. But uh, I've also learned to appreciate that uh, all of the things that people with ADD have trouble with are things everybody has trouble with sometimes. It's just that they're having more trouble with it. Mm -hmm. And that uh, I think that one of the things that I have tried to do in my work and in particularly in my writing, as well as in just talking with patients, is to try and put uh, in plain language what ADHD is. And I have developed a model, uh, which I've written about quite a bit, which basically says, look, we can talk about ADHD and you know, identify within it half a dozen different chunks of things and that uh, of functions. One that people who have this have trouble getting organized and getting started. There's often a lot of procrastination and uh, difficulty activating themselves to get going. Another is that uh, people with AD often complain about difficulty in being able to focus, not in the sense of, you know, uh, hold the camera still and focus on uh, to take the picture, but more in the sense of focus on your driving. You know, because when you're driving, you're not gluing your eyes to the bumper of the car in front of you, you're watching what they're doing. But you're also noticing that there's a truck backing out of a driveway. There's <laughs> pedestrians running across the street to catch a bus. You have to make a shift to the left-hand turn lane in order to get down there. The meanwhile, this traffic light ahead of you is turning from green to red. And you've got to get your foot off the accelerator and onto the brake. And while you're doing that, you notice that the police have somebody stopped over there and you're kind of curious about who they got and what are they doing there and <laughs> has it been an accident or not. And then meanwhile, you're also having to think about what you might want to get when you get to the grocery store. And it's that kind of focus where one has to be able to take account of this, ignore that, and then go back and check this out again and remember what you just saw 
and gradually put the process together so you can safely drive the car. And I think that it's that expanded notion of the scope of ADHD, uh, which rings true for many people who are, are dealing with this. And so I've just listened to a lot of people describe that and, and uh, the models that I've written, written about are based primarily on what my patients have told me. The third cluster is uh, regulating, uh, you know, effort and sustaining mm -hmm. effort. You know, within that, uh, I made it a point to introduce the notion of sleep as an area of difficulty for many people with ADHD. Mm -hmm. Difficulty falling asleep, difficulty staying asleep, difficulty in being awake, and sometimes difficulty in staying alert over the course of the day that this is a problem which is not often talked about as part of ADHD, but is certainly a, a, an important part of, of what most of these people are dealing with. Uh, another aspect of it, as I've written about, is uh, the emotion. issue of emotion. The DSM-5 includes nothing about problems with emotion as an aspect of ADHD. And it seems to me that that's to ignore the reality of what we learn from talking with people who have ADHD. You know, the kinds of things that, that uh, I, you know, learn about from my patients are, you know, things, let me just give a few examples. Uh, salesman I spoke with one time came in and he said, you know, I was in a diner having lunch yesterday and I was in a pretty good mood sitting there eating my sandwich. The guy in the booth behind me gets his sandwich. He's chewing too loud. He's going chomp, chomp, chomp on every bite. He said, there's something about that noise was driving me nuts. It's as though a computer virus had gotten into my head and just gobbled up all the space. And that's all I could think about is that damn noise. I'm sitting there with my fist clenched, seriously thinking about getting up and smacking him in the mouth because he was chewing so obnoxiously loud. He said, I didn't do it. I didn't want to get arrested. If I'd been at home, I would have been yelling at somebody or walked out of the room. He said, then it was strange because after a few minutes, he's still making the same noise. And then it didn't bother me anymore. He says, stuff like that happens to me a lot. Well, there'll be some little frustration, the kind of thing that on a scale of frustration from zero to 10, most people would say, that's a zero or a one. At the most, maybe it's a two. Well, hit me like the seven or an eight or a nine. Uh, but then usually after a little bit, it passes. But he said, it's not always that way. He said, the day before that, I'm at the office. I'm walking down the hall. A friend of mine who works in the other department is coming around the corner, walking toward me, reading some papers as he's walking. Hadn't seen him for a long time. So as we approached each other, I stopped and said, hey, what's up? How are you doing? I we stop and chat for a minute. He looks up, says hi, puts his head down, keeps right and walk. Now, he said, most people have blown it off in a minute. And figure was probably in a hurry. He's got to get to a meeting or something. We'll talk later. He said, not me. He said, that happened at lunchtime. I got nothing done for the rest of the day. I spent all afternoon thinking I'd do something to piss him off, or maybe it's something to offend somebody in this department. They're all angry with me. Or maybe I'm just the kind of person nobody likes and nobody will tell me about, but I couldn't get it out of my head. Other people, it's not like that. They get an idea in their head of something they want to do or something they want to get or something they want to buy. And all of a sudden, that wish takes on such strong urgency. The feeling is, I've got to have it now. And it almost doesn't matter how expensive it is or how inconvenient it is for them or for somebody else or whether they're using time and money now for this, that they know they need something else tomorrow that's more important. They're just this relentless push. And they will keep that up until they get it or they hit a brick wall. Another option, there's some people who, who are very different. Their focus in emotion is that they worry a lot. I was talking with a woman. She said, I was driving down the freeway. I'm in the left lane. I've got the Jersey barrier to my left. 18-wheeler truck, big truck in the next lane over, just a little bit ahead of me. We're cruising about 65 miles an hour. Truck starts pulling over a little bit. Didn't get in my lane, got me thinking about what would happen if he didn't see me? And he pulled over and squished my car against the Jersey Barrier. And soon I am not just thinking about it, I'm running a very vivid movie in my head, imagining exactly what it would look like if that truck came over and smashed into my car, crumpled the car, sharp pieces of metal are sticking into me, I'm bleeding to death. The car's drag, getting dragged along the Jersey barrier, truck deck knives, tries and cars and trucks behind us are hitting us repeatedly. Massive traffic jam, takes a long time to get the rescue squad in to cut me out of the car. By that time I bled to death, they have to call my family and tell my dad, and all this while I'm trying to drive the car 65 miles an hour down the road. And she says, stuff like happens to me a lot. I get this what if thing. You know, so it's, you know, there are other emotions certainly uh, that we see in, in people with ADHD as we see them in ourselves. But, you know, whether it's a matter of, of, of being uh, easily frustrated or and angry, being preoccupied with uh, have to get this or that that I want, or 
worrying about, well, what if this happens or what if that happens? The fact is most people with ADD have difficulty in dealing with emotions that may be bottom up in terms of their sourcing. But mm -hmm. the difficulty is because of the impairments of working memory, they have difficulty back. with the top down part and sometimes will act in ways that, uh, that make the situation worse rather than better. It is so important, Tom, what you're saying, because many of these patients that are, are not already knowing that they have ADHD, they do make a consultation because they are worried. So they get the diagnosis of anxiety disorder, or maybe they have this outrage moments and problems with impulsivity. So they get bipolar disorder diagnosis or many of this because yeah. of but lack of knowledge. Is, yeah, the fact is a lot of clinicians are not, not that familiar with the understanding we have these days of ADHD. Mm. For 20 years, I taught the, at the annual meeting of the American Psychiatric Association. For 20 years, I taught the course. You know how those, you have those yeah. courses, you pay extra, and then you take crash course in this or that specialty. I taught the courses on ADHD, though, both the basic and the advanced. And I often would begin the class with two or 300 psychiatrists saying, how much time did you folks have in your medical education and your residency to learn about ADHD? And the answers range from zero to 20 minutes. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that, you know, having taught in a fairly decent medical school for a long time, I certainly understand how difficult it is to change curriculum. But well, I, I think that it's very difficult for people working in the field who do not have any opportunity to learn about ADHD to, as you had suggested, uh, Norma, to, to assume that they're dealing with the things they're used to most of the time. Yes, you know, it's depression, it's anxiety, and, and so forth. And, and, and to not see the larger context in which this exists. And it's so important what you say, because we want with Eleonora and through the chapter to increase awareness in professionals of the need that they did not Yeah, well, I think that's a very important I think it's a very yes. important thing to do. Let me just uh, quickly wrap up the other uh, components of my, my six-factor yeah. model of ADHD. You are uh, and another critical, important, uh, critically important component is memory. You know, and the problem with most people, you ask them, people with ADHD, you say, "How's your memory?" Often they say, "Oh, I've got the best memory in my family. I can remember stuff nobody else can remember." They give you some example about some movie they saw 15 years ago, and they can tell you every detail of the storyline of the movie they saw 15 years ago. They haven't seen it but once. Uh, or somebody else will say, "I have in my head 450 songs that were popular back in the 70s. All the music, all the lyrics, all the verses." But even though they're very good about being able to recall things like that often their difficulty is not so much with long-term storage memory, it's more often short-term working memory. It's the kind of thing you depend on when you call the tele telephone information operator, get a phone number, you have to hold it in your head while you dial it because you've got nothing to write it down. That's often hard because they'll start uh, transposing the digits. Or you go to the other room, get something, stand there scratching your head around what the hell you came in here for. Okay. You know, or. You, you're working on some project, you go downstairs to get something you need for the project, see something else that's interesting or something else that needs doing, soon you're up to your elbows in project number two, having totally forgotten you're in the middle of project number one upstairs, it was kind of important to get it done. Students complain, they'll be in class, teacher asks the question, they raise their hand, they've got a good answer for it. Teacher calls on somebody else first. You have to wait while this other kid says, Hirsch did. I forgot. Teacher comes back <laughs> and says, yeah, what were you going to say? It's like, totally cool. This is not all... Not only have I forgotten what I was going to say, but what was the question again? Or they will read something, and this really drives them nuts. They'll read something, understand it perfectly well at the moment that they read it, turn the page, read the next page, and pretty soon they realize they've had not the foggiest idea of what they just read in the page before. Mm -hmm. You know, though, and or if it really drives them nuts, is the students will study for a test the night before the test. They'll go over it. Somebody can quiz them, they've got it. They go into class the next day thinking they're gonna get a good grade on this. And all of a sudden a big chunk of what they knew the night before has evaporated. Can't pull it out of their head when they need it. But a few hours or a few days later, something tr you know, triggers their memory and it's all back again. It's not that they didn't have it, it's they couldn't retrieve it when they needed it. Okay. Or you're getting ready to go someplace. You think five things you need to take with you. Half an hour later, you're walking out the door, you got one of them. Can't remember the other four to save your life. Mm -hmm. Or you have to hold one thing in mind while doing something else. That's the kind of memory problem that we usually hear about from people with ADHD. 
And then finally, action. You know, everybody's pretty familiar with the fact that there are some people with ADD who are really hyper as kids. And then as they get a little bit older into adolescence, they're not so hyper anymore. Although there are some exceptions. There are some people who have, have that knee bouncing syndrome, uh, which goes on constantly in conversations and, and you know, people who can't stop talking. You know, some of these action problems, but the bigger problem uh, often is impulsiveness. You know, I was talking recently with a man who said, I love target shooting, but I'm terrible at it. And I said, why? He said, well, you know how they always say ready, aim, fire. You know, well, I, I know I have to get my right, rifle up there and I have to line up the sights so I can see exactly where on the target I'm trying to hit. They have my finger on the trigger ready to slowly squeeze it when it's time. But what happens is even though I know this ready, aim, fire thing, uh, once I get it up there like that, I squeeze the trigger too soon. And so the effect is I'm not doing ready, aim, fire. I'm doing ready, fire, aim. <laughs> and as a result, I, I tend not to be a very good shot. So it's this aggregate of these half dozen different components that I use as a way of thinking about uh, ADHD. But what have you achieved personally involved in this field? And did you find any cultural, social, gender, age barriers on that path? Step from your way through your ADHD role, would you say you are today? And what do you imagine the ADHD field to be like in the future? Well, I don't know. I'm, I'm hoping we're going to get uh, some better medications to deal with it. Uh, and there certainly have been some developments in that. And I think we're also, also learning uh, the better uh, about how to combine our ADHD medicines with other treatments. Mm -hmm. uh, although obviously we need to do that carefully because uh, otherwise it just gets to be sort of a, a mess. But I also think that we need to look more specifically about uh, at you know some other combinations of things. And uh, my newest book, which will be published uh, probably sometime in late spring or during the summer uh, is called ADHD and Asperger syndrome in smart kids and adults, because uh, specializing as I do in high IQ folks, I often get a lot of kids and adults who have Asperger syndrome, many of whom have not been identified as having this difficulty. Absolutely. And so what I've done in this book, which will be published by Rutledge, uh, this, I think probably this summer, um, is to, I've got a chapter updating my understanding of what ADHD is about and another chapter describing Asperger's, which as you know, has been removed from the DSM yes. and the International yes. Classification of Diseases, which yes. I think was a mistake hmm. uh, because we need that more specific description. You, otherwise we're putting together people who have very, very different treatment needs. And, uh, hmm. So I wanted to, to describe Asperger's syndrome as I understand it and uh, try and describe then uh, theoretically about it and sort of what the science is. But then the bulk of the, of the uh, book and the subtitle for it is uh, 12 stories of struggles, support and treatment. Uh, so that they've part. got case studies. On, yes. uh, some children, some teenagers, and some adults that I've treated who have both Asperger's and ADHD. And it's currently, if I can make a commercial for it, it's currently listed on Amazon, yeah. even though it's going to be a while well, before it's out. So. We're going to have that. I don't have that. I love the paper books, paper books, so you can sign them. I have all your books signed for you. So this, I have to buy it. And then you have okay, to sign well, it. I, it's not out it's yet, time. but you can order it. And <laughs> yes. uh, I'll well, be happy to sign it as soon as our paths this cross again. COVID, yes, when COVID is over, I think we, I would love to go back and see you. So um, I think this is an amazing thing to have you talking so much about the clinic, uh, all the support of the, for patients that really need to be heard. Uh, and we would love if you could just give us some like, uh, words what is your message you would like to share with us for all the people just professional and people with adhd because you are one of my favorite people in the adhd field very and kind of you and uh i guess if i were to say something that i would say one thing i think that it's important for those of us who work in the field 
to try to uh, help our colleagues understand ADHD better because uh, the medical school and the training of psychologists uh, these days still doesn't provide adequate training about this sort of thing. So your, your take home message will be training and knowledge and, and, and share this. Yeah, with I think our... that about ADHD, but the other thing I would do is to reiterate uh, what I think we all have learned uh, and uh, been reminded about, and that is to listen to the patients. That's a word. Because they will, tell us, they will tell us about these things. And if you have the framework of ADHD in mind, uh, it's possible then to see how sometimes you've got things that are overlapping and that uh, that can guide treatment. You know, Tom, I had a chance always to tell something about what I suffered as an ADHD adult when I was in therapy for psychoanalysis so many years, talking about the thousands of things I lost. I kept talking, maybe that's why I say listen to the patients, but you have to know what to listen. And I was talking all the time about how many things I lost, my keys, my car, everything. And this doctor, uh, I had the horror and sad part in my life that my first baby died three days after he was born. And she said, you know what, you also lost a child. Yeah. And that was a very hard thing, but it ended this period of my therapy and I started cognitive therapy then. But mm -hmm. uh, sometimes we have to know that the person that's listening has the, all these distinctions to understand what are you talking about? So maybe that yeah, is- To, to, to get the message. message that you know, underlying all these little losses Sometimes there's a bigger loss that has not yet been fully processed. But we need to know that we have to just uh, really focus on learning and having this all this data that we have today about neuroscience and imaging and all yeah, this but it, research. Yeah, but it comes website. down to how do you apply it when you're talking with people? Yes. And I think that, that we need to do a better job of sharing. And I think this project you have of trying to share information with colleagues about ADHD and various perspectives on it is a good contribution to be making. Uh, you know, so all of us can go on learning from one another. Yes. And I appreciate the opportunity to talk with you. It's been a long time since I've been to BA. Invite you here, Tom. Yes. Our pleasure would be to guest you. Well, here. I would love to come back again. My wife and I were there once before, many years ago, and uh, would love to do that. But uh, we're obviously quite limited in what we can do now in terms of traveling. But, but uh, we can still share conversations and yes. share what we're able to to read and write. I thank you both for your kindness thank and you. inviting me to thank do you, this. Thank you, Tom. Thank you Have very much, day. Tom. Thank you very Have a nice much. Day. Thank you. Bye. Take care. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.